Okay, let's try that again. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go onto the screen and we should go from there. Excellent. Okay, so from beginning. Oh, yes, okay, victory is ours. Um, oh, but now you're all here, so I can all see you in the recording. There we go. Okay, so oh, today we're coming, talking about um, the devil and demonic depiction within the Gothic. So um, as usual, I've put up my Twitter handle there and my hashtag. So do feel free to live tweet or to contact me on Twitter um, or just use the hashtag to kind of communicate with each other or follow the kind of fun things we're doing during the week. The title is taken from one of the sections of my thesis. Um, it's a subsection. But the devil is transformed into an angel of light, which is obviously that quote from 2 Corinthians 11.14. And we're looking at this um, specific uh, conception to some extent of the devil as we, as we go through demonic depiction within uh, the Gothic tradition. Now, as many of you know, I am... Um, my main area of expertise is in the early British Gothic, so the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And so that's really where I'm going to be focusing. And as I said before, I'm going to be dividing us into um, a consideration of three different um, forms of demonic depiction. And I'm going to be looking at, <coughs> um, well, I'll go into that as we go in, but three different forms of demonic depiction. And I'm going to be looking principally at the 18th and 19th centuries and giving you a little bit of an idea of where these branches started to go in the 20th century and some of the evolutions that you're going to see. So one of the things that we have to do before we can start to talk about the Gothic um, is go way back <laughs> because the picture that you can see there is obviously Paradise Lost by John Milton which again is obviously not a Gothic text, but before we can discuss the demons of the Gothic, what we need to do is interact with um, the paradigms and understanding of Satan that these texts are using. So the first question we have is, will the real Satan please stand up? Now it's a bit of a difficult question here, who Satan is and what his story is. Often when we think of the satanic narrative, the, of the fall and the rebellion and the war in heaven, we have this um, idea that it comes directly from the Bible, but that's not really true. Um, what we have in um, the Bible are some verses pieced together, um, but what you're finding is actually that literary writers and theologians are creating their own history. Um, so what we have in the Bible is actually really quite meager, and I'm going to go through the verses that we have in terms of that story of the satanic fall. Now, in terms of um, other aspects of demonic identity, such as this idea of the de devil as the father of lies, the false teacher, the idea of the Antichrist, and this conception of the devil as a roaring lion, I'll get back to those later. I'm not going to look at those verses now. I'm just looking at the story of Satan right now. So the first part and the most um, relevant of our verses is Luke 10, 18. So this is what Jesus himself says about the devil. And this is all he says about the devil, the devil's story. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's it. That's all we've got. Um, and you see this obviously here very clearly an element of that satanic myth that we have with the fall from heaven. But that's all we get. We don't get any history. We don't get any story. We don't know when it happened before or after the fall of man, for example. A second verse is found in Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. I've put it out here for you. So how you have fallen from heaven, O morning, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in throne on the mount of assembly on the utmost height of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high but you were brought down to the pit and to the depths, that brought down to the grave and to the depths of the pit. So again, here we're clearly seeing some of those elements of the satanic story, the overweening pride, the challenging of God. But the problem here is the context in which this is written. So um, this Isaiah verse is actually in a prophecy against the king of Babylon. 
So it's often been read in the, the, theological discourse in both the Judaic and the Christian traditions as relating potentially to this sort of satanic figure, but we don't have a very clear narrative going on there. We don't have a clear story or a certainty that this is what's going on. Now in Revelation, we have quite a few verses about um, battles in heaven and falls, etc. Uh, this is one of them. You might recognize some of the aspects of it here. This idea of Satan engaging in a great battle with troops in number like the sand on the seashore, marching against God's city and the people he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So again, another element of the satanic narrative, this plunging into burning flame, but again, very disparate pieces coming together. There's not much to tie this to those um, verses in Isaiah. And we have to remember, of course, that Re Revelation is a future prophecy um, for the most part. Revelation 9.1, again, um, this isn't necessarily a future prophecy, but it's unclear, potentially allegorical, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. So again, this idea of the fall, the devil's lordship over, um, over hell. So all of these verses are giving us some of these key features we're finding in satanic narratives. But what we have to remember is that people are putting these together. People are creating these master narratives. Um, one critic, William Perry, for example, has said it's Milton and not Revelation that's created the particular concepts of hell, heaven, Satan and God that we have. And there isn't really that much of a firm biblical narrative. The clearest and most coherent sort of story we have is found in 2 Enoch 29, 3 and 4. We're told that out of the order of angels, he turned away with the order that was under him, conceived an impossible thought to place his throne higher than the clouds above the earth, that he might become equal in rank to my power. And I threw him out from the height with his angels and he was flying in the air continuously above the bottomless. So this is more clearly this sort of story of the fall and the challenge related to a past time. It's not a prophecy. It's related directly to sort of Satan here. But the problem is, and you might recognize this, what's to Enoch? Most, most of us probably don't know to Enoch. It's because it's a pseudo epigraphic text which means that um, it's been proven that it wasn't written by who it was said to be written by, and it's an apocryphal text, so it's in the apocrypha. So within the Bible, we don't have a clear satanic narrative, which leaves a lot of wiggle room for literary writers to work with, and you certainly find this in the Gothic. So let's do a little bit of Satan spotting in Gothic narratives. How can you tell if you've met Satan? What are some of the warning signs that maybe you're having an encounter with the demonic? Have you seen Satan recently? Firstly, has a giant camel head appeared out of nowhere? If so, Satan. Did you wake up covered in luminescent snails? Satan. Did you sort of enter some catacombs one time for reasons? Um, an, an inconceivably beautiful young man just kind of popped up out of some smoke? Satan. Did a young woman suddenly appear in your life, possibly dressed originally as a man? who happens to look exactly like the painting of the Virgin Mary that you've been secretly, I mean, you could just say devoting yourself to, but certainly I think it went a bit further than that. Maybe it's a bit more simple. Maybe you just need to check if your friend's got some cloven hooves. Another possibility here, they might not be very easy to note, but you might meet someone new, you get on well, they wanna spend time with you, they want you to commit crimes with them they do look a lot like you. Or perhaps they look quite a lot like that friend of yours who fell down a well recently and was horribly mangled, but yet appears to be alive and well for some reason. So all of these are examples of satanic figures that you find in the Gothic. You can see there's a lot of leeway here, particularly with the snails. But what you're also getting is quite clear borrowing and working on existing literary narratives of the demonic. So I'm going to very quickly go over a few of those and some of the aspects of them that you're going to find repeated in Gothic depictions of the demonic. So one of the first and most famous of the developed depictions of hell and Satan is found obviously in Dante's um, Divine Comedy in the, the Inferno part. 
So this was written in 1320 or uh, finished in 1320 and depicts um, the nine circles of hell. And as you can possibly see in the background of the slide, you've got this kind of conical hell going on, which gets narrower as it goes towards the bottom, towards the greatest sins. And in the ninth circle of hell, you have the traitors, including, of course, Satan. Now, Satan here is very particularly imagined. He's half stuck in ice, as you can see in the picture, from the chest up, he's out of the ice. He's incredibly large, as you'd expect. That's a fairly common feature of satanic narratives. And incredibly ugly. There's a sense uh, in the text of a beauty completely lost and revolutionized. Now he has three heads, one on each side. Um, one is red, one is yellow and or white, and one is black. Under each face, he has two bat wings. And his chin is dripping with blood and tears because each of his six eyes is weeping. And he's got stuff in his mouth <laughs> that means that he's got blood spurting out everywhere. And the stuff in his mouth is people. So in um, the red face, you have Judas. In the black face, you have Brutus. And in the white yellow face, you have Cassius. All three of them famous traitors. Obviously, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. And Brutus and Cassius were two people that betrayed Julius Caesar. So you have here a couple of different conceptions. You have this monstrosity of the demonic. You also have this idea of him as an agent of punishment. And you're also getting really kind of visually and, and viscerally developed this sort of sense of um, the tragedy as well of this satanic figure to some extent, even though he's very, clearly very evil here. Another key narrative is that of the Faust and Mephistopheles relationship. So going back in time, there's also, there's obviously pre-existing folkloric elements, but the first published uh, work on Faust was the German chapbook, Historia von Dr. Johann Fausten. Sorry about my pronunciation. Um, then obviously you're getting it quickly taken up, Christopher Marlowe's tragical history of Dr. Faustus. And then in the Romantic period, moving on, you've got the Faust by Goethe, which is possibly the most famous today. Um, it was published in two parts, part one in 1808, part two in 1834. Um, and here you have obviously quite a few key elements of the demonic narrative that you're going to be finding in the, in the Gothic and something that's really not in the Bible at all. So part of what you're finding here is this narrative of the devil's ability to change shape and appearance. So in the original 1587 chapbook, he first appears as a griffin or dragon turns into a fiery star, becomes a glowing ball, turns into a burning man, and then is just a gray friar at the end. So you have this um, shape change, in this case, particularly to awe the viewer, the, uh, to awe Faust. In Christopher Marlowe's 1592 version, you have a, a, an ugly or hideous demonic form which Faust rebukes, and he takes the form, of, again, of a gray friar. There's some interesting connections here, quite obviously, between conceptions of uh, the Catholic Church, perhaps, and the demonic, and those narratives of, um, those sort of anti-Catholic narratives of um, the, the Catholic Church as the Whore of Babylon. You've also got, in the 1808 version, which obviously isn't influencing the Gothic, it's arising at the same period towards the later half of the period, you've got a creature of flame who becomes a poodle, who becomes a traveling scholar. The main thing here is this idea of duplicity, deceit, and shape changing. That's how this duplicity and deceit takes um, place. You've also got, of course, the really important concept here of the demonic pact. Now, there's a whole other area of demonic pacts, which is the witchcraft pacts, which we're not talking about today. It's a whole different area of study. But this kind of concept of the demonic pact in which you have a special case victim, usually an overreacher seeking after knowledge, who is forced into committing themselves to paper um, into a binding contract with the devil. Now that is very much a sort of literary folkloric invention. There's nothing like that, of course, in the devil, and it very much, in the Bible, sorry, it very much goes against that kind of biblical narrative of the devil wandering around looking for any old victim. There's also this sense in which you have to have a willed submission in a specific act to be damned rather than just everyday sin. So it's, it's quite a, um, an, an almost anti-biblical narrative. It's not, a very, it's not very theologically sound. 
The last Satan and the most influential in the British tradition, um, and particularly in the way it depicted the whole story of the fall, was John Milton's Satan in Paradise Lost, of course. Um, and I've put a, a bit of a, a longer quote here from book one to get an idea of the, of the Satan that we're being confronted with here and his particular aspects. So apart from the story which is fleshed out of the fall and of sin and of death and of the lake of fire and of the, the abyss and of the halls of uh, chaos, you have this idea of Satan as the dread commander. He above the rest in shape and gesture proudly eminent stood like a tower. His form had not yet lost all her original brightness, nor appeared less than archangel ruined and the excess of glory obscured. I'm just going to skip forward a bit. Darkened so, yet shone above all the archangel, but his face deep scars of thunder had entrenched and care sat on his faded cheek, but under brows of dauntless courage and considerate pride waiting revenge. Cruel his eye, but cast signs of remorse and passion to behold the fellows of his crime, the followers rather. So here, quite obviously, you have um, a very particular idea of Satan. Now, this Satan is quite clearly sublime, both in his physical depiction and in his moral attributes. There's a, a, a high degree of emphasis on this conception of him as an archangel ruined, still carrying around with him the remnants of that divine sublimity that he previously had. You've also got here, very evidently, the roots of that romantic rereading and this conception of Satan as dauntless, prideful, rebellious, resistant. But you're also finding this Satan influencing the Gothic. So it's not, um, don't skip ahead into the romantic rereading because John Milton's uh, theology of the devil is still relatively orthodox. And you have this narrative where through the consecutive books of Paradise Lost, he becomes less and less sublime. He becomes more and more obviously weak and vindictive and bitter and a failure. So, You've got all of these elements coming together. So creating this sort of recipe for a Gothic Satan, the, the key elements on which these, these demonic uh, depictions draw. You've got the idea, of course, of demonic monstrosity and this visual imagery of the demonic from Dante and from, and from Milton to some extent as well. You've also got, of course, this kind of theologically orthodox conception of the devil as evil, as directly opposed to God as a force of good. He's the enemy of God, and he also manifests himself in deceptive form. So you've got this echoing of the biblical narrative or reading of, of Satan as the snake, for example, here, adopting different forms to deceive. You've also got this heritage of the demonic pact, the special case Faustian pact as the punishment of the overreacher. You have the devil also as an agent of judgment, often unwilling. So you have that image, for example, of Dante's devil in hell chewing on the, the other traitors. Or Milton's Satan um, becoming kind of the, the ruler of hell. You also have this emphasis, particularly in the Milton, on a ruined angelic nature and this, this sublimity of the demonic, which I will return to in a bit more detail later on. So I'm going to look at a couple of different Gothic or Gothic adjacent texts to talk about the devil. And the first one I'm going to look at isn't specifically Gothic necessarily. It's, it's from the French school and it is <clears throat> in the fantastic tradition or fantastique. Um, the fantastic tradition, um, we can look at Todorov, Svetan Todorov's definition of that, is this idea of a hesitation where you're unsure between a natural and a supernatural explanation for the plot. Um, and in a true fantastic novel, that hesitation lasts to the end of the novel. So you're never really quite sure what happens. And that's kind of the case in The Devil in Love. So you have a young seeker after knowledge, Don Alvaro, who is Spanish. And he has got in with some of the sort of cults and secret societies, which were such a popular focus of fiction, particularly in Germany in the, the, the 1790s. And they have talked to him about the possibility of summoning demons. So he summons a demon, as you do, but he rushes the process. He doesn't want to do the two years of study, so he just goes ahead. And obviously that was a mistake. And he summons a demon that appears in the form of a curious camel. So you can see in the background, perhaps, of this slide quite faintly, um, the picture of this massive camel head just appearing through a window and saying, Kevoy, what do you want? Um, 
Now, he rebukes the demon. Originally, he's afraid, then he rebukes the demon. And the demon turns into a dog. Um, and then he says, he explains what he wants from the demon. He wants to put on a big feast for all of his friends. And um, so the demon then changes into a page, but also a harpist maid. So there's this kind of gender ambiguity. So one of the things that's really important about the devil in love is its influence on these later Gothic narratives and particularly the monk by Matthew Lewis. Um, and I'll go back to this idea of gender ambiguity later. The main temptation here isn't about, a, a, it's not a case of sort of signing a contract in blood. It's a bit weirder than that. Basically the contract is virginity. So beyond Detta, throughout the rest of the novel, appearing in female form, will be trying to tempt Don Alvaro into having sex with her basically. And that would be the moment that he is condemned forever. So um, a lovely bit of moralizing there on sexual norms going on. And you have this idea of the pact, but one which is sealed by the free possession of the other. So Biondetta says, I wanted to possess you and my success required you to give yourself to me freely. So again, this sort of sense that you saw in those Faustian pacts of it being necessary um, for the, the victim to acquiesce in a sense to their own damnation. Um, and after this, you have this immediate change after they have this sexual encounter of Biondetta revealing herself as Beelzebub or, or as, as the devil. And immediately the pronouns change to he, him. And you have this, again, this gender shift, which is quite interesting. And again, that kind of evocation of ambiguity. And then the devil's like, yo, I want you to know the real me, bro. And so he becomes a, a load of snails. <laughs> So I've got the, um, the reading for you there that the cornice above the panelling was covered in huge snails. Their horns, which they moved briskly to and fro, had become jets of phosphorescent light. whose brightness was intensified by their movement and their forward thrust. Almost dazzled by this sudden illumination, I cast my eyes to my side. And instead of a ravishing presence, what do I see? Oh, heavens, it's the frightful camel's head. In a voice of thunder, it articulated that, that hollow cavoy which had so terrified me in the grotto, then uttered a burst of human laughter more frightful still and stuck out an enormous tongue. So, I mean, fabulous, isn't it? It's great. Um, I can't see anyone's reaction, but I hope you love it as much as me because it's great. Um, so this is just really bizarre here encounter with the demonic. Now, obviously, quite a lot of these beats are not going to be picked up. This is quite an outlier in terms of demonic depiction. I don't remember any other camels or snails, but quite a lot of these aspects are then going to go into the depiction of the devil in the monk by Matthew Lewis, including this concentration on lust um, as part of the, the satanic fall, the conception as well of this gender ambiguity in the demonic figure, and this um, emphasis on a sort of special case with uh, weakness in them. So we're moving on to a, a truly Gothic example, which is Matthew Lewis's The Monk from 1796. This is one of the most famous Gothic novels, but if you've not read it, um, the basic story, and I'm not going to go into the secondary subplot here, but the basic story is about Ambrosio, who is the man of holiness, this really held up monk, uh, superior in Madrid. And he is very prideful, thinks himself without sin, and therefore becomes a target of the devil. And so his fall is perpetuated largely by lust, but not entirely. Um, but he, he starts his fall by sort of falling in love or being attracted to um, a young novice called Rosario, who it's revealed is actually Matilda, who is, according to this part of the story, it's her picture that he's been kind of uh, mooning over for a while, the, her picture um, as, the, as, as the Virgin Mary. Of course, that's not really what's happened. Uh, she's a demon, we, we find out at the end, and she, was, um, she made herself look like the picture, but still. Um, so he falls in lust, uh, they have the sex, and then he goes kind of bored of her and wants a more pure woman anyway. So he ends up falling in love with Antonia and pursuing her and just descends into this pit of crime and um, incest and matricide and kidnapping and just 
falls, 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 um, until he eventually signs his soul over to the devil in order to escape the prisons of the Inquisition. Now, one of the key aspects of this story, and one of the key theological beats, really, is this idea of the deceptive nature of the devil, and specifically deceptive beauty. So the devil first appears to um, Ambrosio in the scene that you can see in the background there. Let me just re-show it to you. This is a scene where Matilda is helping Ambrosio to conjure the devil in order to get some special magical powers, like a magical myrtle leaf that you can use to walk through walls and attack people. Anyway, he is expecting this sort of horrendous, sublime, monstrous demonic presence, but instead he gets a figure more beautiful than Fancy's pencil ever drew. A youth seemingly scarce 18, the perfection of whose form and face was unrivaled. He was perfectly naked. Um, we were talking a little bit last week about transgressive and queer desire, and I think, here you go, that's the perfect exemplification of this. But we have this idea of the, of the devil originally appearing in beauty. But by the end of the narrative, when Ambrosio is in the Inquisition and the devil returns to um, ask for his soul in return for his freedom from the Inquisition, we have this revelation of the other true identity of the devil, true visual identity of the devil. And he appears as this sort of monstrous creature, um, scarred by the fall, thunder blasted, very much borrowing from a Miltonic conception here. Um, and it's this moment in which um, the devil is sublimely revealed that Ambrosio's judgment is enacted. And I'm going to go back to that issue of the sublime in a second. But first, I just want to look at another um, Gothic text, which has quite a similar relationship of demonic temptation. And that's the Floyer by Charlotte Dacker, which is often viewed as a sort of female version of um, the monk. So what happens here is we have Victoria Loredani. Uh, when she's younger, her mother runs away with another man, leaves her husband. She lives with her mother. At one point, she gets sent away to a kind of really strict aunt. She runs away from there. She ends up becoming the mistress of a man. And when she saves his life, he marries her. But she's angry because she realizes when he proposes that previously he hadn't thought her worthy of marriage with him. Anyway, this sort of sows the seeds of discontent and vengeance and bitterness, which aren't helped by the fact that she then falls in love with Henriquez, who's her, her brother-in-law, and thus begins the downward path of poisoning and lust and rape and kidnap and murder. Um, and it's all sort of facilitated by this demonic figure who appears once again in a beautiful guise. And again, there's this element of transgressive sexuality through this kind of eroticism and in increasingly desirous depictions of the, the Moors of Floya. The Moors of Floya is actually dead, but the devil's taken on his shape. And he first appears to um, Victoria in her dreams, which is an interesting little aside here, and I could talk about it for several hours. But in the 18th century, you do have this continuing um, conception or belief in the power of the devil or the demonic to influence dreams. And that's what we have here. And he appears in this noble and majestic form. And we have this quite excessive, rich, luxurious description. And that's only the beginning of these descriptions of Zafloy, which become more and more sort of tender, more and more obsessed as the text goes on. Something that's particularly interesting about Zafloy is the demonization of the main character. We don't really have this in Ambrosio. What we have in Ambrosio is very clearly a fall. Um, he becomes less and less apparently sublime and he becomes sort of sniveling and weak and, and overcome by his own passions and disgusting by the end. For Victoria, she becomes increasingly sublime, echoing that sublimity of the demonic figures of Floya. So, so Floya is always found in the high places among sublime settings such as mountains and forests. He's described with this kind of rich exoticism and often eroticism. And Victoria, as she moves through her crimes, as she grows increasingly sort of unhinged from morality, becomes increasingly sublime herself, increasingly associated with these sublime places, for example. And I think what you see as well is this really interesting echoing in Victoria of demonic desire. So, of course, the, the devil is trying to trick her. But there's also this sense of mutual desiring that isn't quite erased by the text. 
So the devil at the end, once he's revealed him, uh, just before he reveals himself says, I cannot Victoria compel thee, nor so dearly do I covet thee, will thy forced compliance satisfy me. Say then at once, wilt thou unequivocally give thyself to me heart and body and soul? So evidently there's this sense in which he's trying to get her compliance to her own damnation. But the language throughout has often been more about desire and romanticization. And you have this sense in Victoria of these monstrous, but not simply monstrous, but demonic desires. But as we're going to look at in a second, the continuing sublimity of the devil, even once he's cast as a, um, Victoria down the cliff and erased her sublimity by making her just a massive putrid flesh, his continuing sublimity gives some sign of force and val it valorizes to some extent these transgressive desires which they've shared. And there's quite a lot of times that Zafloy has actually been read as quite a transgressive text by critics like Chloe Chard in, in the way in which it's depicting feminine desire, femi feminine autonomy. And although it's seemingly punished at the end, there's this sense of like a transgressive remaining of, of these desires. Before I go into some more Theo aesthetics, I just want to have a quick demonic villain showdown with you because both of these villains are special case packs and they're both sort of told by the devil very flatteringly that they're the worst of the worst of the worst. Ambrosio is told hell bears no miscreant more guilty than yourself and Victoria that few venture far as thou hast ventured in the alarming paths of suicide. But how do they stack up to each other? As you can see here, Ambrosio only has two murders to Victoria's three, but he has a matricide and a sororicide, where she only has a matricide. So there's lots of illicit sex on both parts. Um, one rape for each of them. Ambrosio um, engages with magical powers. To some extent, Victoria does as well with her use of poisons. They both commit one kidnapping, although Ambrosio's is significantly shorter. He just kidnaps his sister, rapes her horribly, and is like, oh, don't you want to live in this channel vault forever? why not? Um, and then kills her. Whereas Victoria kidnaps her love rival and keeps her chained in a cave for a very long time. And quite a lot of um, fairly eroticized female in distress imagery. Uh, you've also got both of them refusing mercy, Ambrosia to a pregnant woman, Agnes, and Victoria to her mother on her mother's deathbed. Um, Victoria also takes the crown perhaps for driving a man to suicide. In both cases, as you can see, their crimes really stack up, but I will leave it to you to decide who is worse. So I'm going to get into the nerd bit now, guys. This is my theoesthetic stuff. So like strap in, it's going to get a bit deep for a second. The demonic sublime. So I've talked about the way in which Milton's Satan was sublime and in which some of these depictions are sublime, both physically and morally. But what am I talking about when I say the sublime, just in case you're not very familiar with it? So it's an aesthetic theory that rose to prominence in the 18th century, originally based on translations of Longinus's treatise on elevation. And a lot of the key and central ideas of it are borrowed from the Longinus treatise. Now, there were many, many theologians um, and theoreticians during the 18th century who wrote on it. The most famous of them is probably, um, of course, Edmund Burke within Studies of the Gothic, but um, I can link to my article later, but it, it's stupidly annoying that everybody only talks about Burke because um, he's far from being the only theoretician. He's far from being... Um, the most valorized as well, I would say, at certain times. And certainly by the 1790s, there were some quite cutting critiques of Edmund Burke's theory, including from Gothic writers like Anne Radcliffe, Anna Letitia Barbold, and, um, and other sort of uh, critics of the picturesque, for example. Um, Burke's version of the sublime was based entirely on terror, but it's worth remembering that in the writing of other theoreticians such as John Dennis, um, Joseph Addison, comes with Rearsby, Earl of Shaftesbury, there are many forms of the sublime. Sublime joy, for example, sublime contemplation. But what, what is the sublime before, before I go on my warble here? So I'm using Burke's language here, but he's very much echoing um, the Longinian original definition of the effect of sublimity, apart from the terror of it. So he talks about um, 
the sublime, an encounter with the sublime creates astonishment, a state of the soul in which mo motions are suspended. And Burke argues with some degree of horror, but it's mixed with admiration, reverence and respect. Our motions are suspended. Our mind is entirely filled with its objects so that we go beyond ourselves. And the subject then leads us to contemplation. There's also this continuing discourse within the 18th century of the sublime or appreciation for the sublime as an inbuilt divinely planted sense, which God gives us in order to find or valorize those attributes that belong to himself. So what we're finding here is increasingly, well, not increasingly, what we're finding with the sublime is it's actually a divine aesthetic in most of the theory of the 18th century. By the way, if you're still wondering what the sublime is or how to feel it, the picture in the background is quite helpful. Imagine standing on a mountaintop. It's that feeling. It's that confrontation with what is more than us and the, the fears of sometimes, but also admiration and reverence, which occurs with it, the wonder, the astonishment. But as I said, there's this idea is the divine and the sublime is intricately connected still throughout the 18th century in the British tradition talking about um, the sublime. And the divine or God becomes the root, the model and the pinnacle of the sublime. So as the root, um, he is the source of the sublimity of all other things. As the model, he's like the, the, the blueprint of what sublimity is. And the pinnacle of sublime is that everything else is basically partially sublime compared to the divine. And you'll find this in writers such as Isaac Brown, who very helpfully talked about the sublime is nourished by one common root. John Dennis, Joseph Addison, Tamsworth Reresby. But why am I talking about all this? Why am I theoaesthetic in you? Well, because it's really relevant for how we understand the appearance of the devil in these texts and also how we interpret their potential transgressions, both in terms of like theological and social mores and norms which are being confronted potentially. Because something that's undeniable in the 18th century and theologically problematic is that this demonic is repeatedly and consistently depicted as sublime. And this is, of course, found in, Par in Paradise Lost by Milton. And it's one of the sort of recurring features of 18th century sublime discourse that Milton's Paradise Lost is the pinnacle of sublime poetry. So there are some orthodox ways to interpret this sublimity, such as we find arguably in an original reading of Milton. So this is idea of perverse sublimity, that the devil's sublimity is perverse because it's borrowed. It's the ruins of the archangel. It's borrowed from God. All of the qualities that are sublime in the devil are a perverted form of that which is, is sublime in God. So his defiance um, is an echo of God's um, unchangeability, for example. Now, in a traditionally more orthodox text, that sublimity would be revealed as perverse, as it is arguably in Milton's Paradise Lost, where you get this unpeeling away of that very sublime image in book one. To what extent does that happen in our text is a bit more difficult to say. And I think there's definitely tensions going on here. Because the reveal at the end is that the devil's not beautiful. He is sublime. So the devil remains sublime at the end. And there's also an interesting issue of positioning. So at the end of both novels, the victims are thrown off the top of a mountain and the devil remains aloft, sublime, elevated. So there's this sense in which there's a tension there because these increasingly, in the case of Victoria, sublime um, anti-heroes or villains, have their sublimity stripped from them. They become things of putrid flesh, broken bones and ruined bodies. So there's this rejection of their transgression, but in the continued elevation of the satanic figure, in this continued sublimity of the satanic figure, we perhaps have some more questions occurring. We perhaps have um, a sort of heterodoxy potentially inserting itself in, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. The other more orthodox conception is this idea of the sublimity of judgment, and you'll find this throughout 18th century religious poetry, for example. The idea that the devil stands in the shadow of the divine, and in enacting these punishments, he's actually replicating and echoing the divine judgment seat, the divine punishment, and becoming arguably an unwilling agent of the divine. <coughs> 
there's a really interesting, um, again, this tension because the devil in adopting the judgment seat and adopting that godly position and defying God in that way, in a sense, ends up by throwing down his victims, reenacting his own fall. And so showing the sort of circularity of his own judgment, unable to escape it. So let's have a look at the, the heterodox implications of some of these, of, of this Gothic theoesthetics of the demonic. Oh, I had pictures, sorry. Um, the first is caused by the unrelinquished sublimity and demonic triumph, where the devil and the transgressive elements of the text, which he represents, such as female autonomy and sexuality in Zafloya, um, and perhaps queer desire in um, the monk, remain sort of free and not entirely suppressed within the text. There's also questions being posed here through the use of the demonic figure. In, in both cases here, you have the question of demonic agency. Is the devil attempting to act against God, but ultimately fulfilling his plan? Does the devil have agency? Can he resist God? Can he legitimately um, rebel against him and act outside of his plan? And if not, what does that say about free will? What does that say about the problem of free will, both for the demonic and for the humans of the text, who themselves find themselves inevitably on this path? You also have this issue of de demonizing the divine. So I said a couple of minutes ago that there are a lot of critiques of um, Burke's uh, philosophical inquiry into the sublime and the beautiful. And one of them is the way in which for him, the sublime is always terror. So the root of the sublime is always terror, which makes God terrifying. It's the God of the Old Testament that appears in Burke's theory. And there's a separation between the God of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New Testament. So you have, in a sense, in texts like these where there's no other form of sublime, there's just demonic sublime cont continually and consistently, you have this idea that there's a demonization of the divine this critique, perhaps, this discomfort, particularly with a Calvinist conception of divinity. Okay, I think I've finished nerding out more or less. Let me just quote myself and then, <laughs> then I will be done. So the demonic sublimity of Lewis and Decker's devils is borrowed from the divine as it defies it and demonizes the divine while it bows to it. They're not atheist texts, but rather in Judith Wilt's terms, and it's a very useful term, I think, heretic texts. But they do not reject the faith they reflect, but maintain a profound and fruitful link with the orthodoxy that defines their terms. So these texts exist in a questioning space of ultimately unresolved tensions of, as Joel Porty terms it, profound religious malaise, which is informed as much by Christian narratives as by skepticism. So I think that lens of heretic texts is a really good way of thinking about them and also thinking about how these Gothic demons continued into our imaginary today. This idea that they're still the bad guy, but there's an element here of heterodoxy in these, he these heretic texts. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples from the 20th century, and then we're going to have our first break. So um, the first example, of course, <laughs> the Dennis Wheatley, if anyone's a Dennis Wheatley fan, and his uh, sort of novels of satanic cults and so on and so forth, definitely the bad guys here, quite an orthodox narrative in a sense. Ira Levin in Rosemary's Baby, um, again, an, a fairly orthodox conception of the devil here um, as uh, an antichrist, as evil, but also um, you're using it to, to critique some of the sort of um, normative structures of society at the time. Peter Blatty and the Exorcist, I think, is a really interesting case because you obviously have the devil um, manifesting through possession, something we're not finding in the early Gothic, uh, manifesting as evil, as the villain of the piece. But you also have this kind of heterodox uncertainty about the efficacy of religious solutions. In other words, do they actually get rid of the devil? No, not really, because there's a sequel. Um, but there's also, it's within the text itself, the devil that enters the child has been met before, has been undefeated before. So there's this failure of religion to cope with um, demonic presences and evil. End of days, had to pop it in there. One of my favorite Satans, Gabriel Byrne. Um, again, a fairly orthodox conception in a sense of a demonic entity. Um, really borrowing from those kind of tales of lust, etc. The third, the last one I want to look at, and one I think is really, really interesting as a heretic text, 
is the prophecy. Um, and there, Satan is played by Viggo Mortensen. And you have this very clear idea that Satan is evil. He enters the text saying, I don't love you. Like, I'm going to help you, but not for you guys. Just let's be clear about that. And offers this threat of sort of causing the protagonist to eat her mother's feces. It's fairly horrendous straight away. But you also have the protagonist teaming up with Satan in this, in this depiction in order to defeat a second type of angel or fallen angel, arguably by the end of the text, um, personified by Gabriel here, who um, is rebelling against God's love for humanity, viewing them as talking monkeys. Um, and you have this sort of, so you have these three different types of angel appearing here. You have the Lucifer, the, the fallen, the evil angel. You have Gabriel, who is not quite there, but is quite clearly amoral. And then you have the Eric Stoltz angel, who is following God's decree. But you have this discomfort with God's decree, because there's a scene in which she explains, I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm just obeying. So you have this sort of uncomfortable sense of the arbitrariness of God and also the horrors and the terrors that he's allowing to happen here within the text. So does this, does this sort of attempt to close it up at the end of the film with this quite annoying voiceover? It's like, oh, maybe we're just saved by faith, guys. Yay. Um, but it doesn't really cut it when you've just won your battle by teaming up with Satan, who literally cannibalizes the heart of the enemy that he's just ripped out of his still beating chest. I don't think you have the moral high ground there. We're like, yeah, it was faith that did it. It's not, it was Satan ripping a heart out. Um, so you've definitely got this really interesting um, heterodoxy. And I think that's what you keep seeing in these modern texts. Even when you have these evil Satans, not anti-heroic, but evil, you're getting these heretic text elements. So break time. Let me tempt you into a question. Hopefully you'll have survived. I haven't seen you, so you might just have all been snoozing away at the Theo aesthetics there. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so I'm here. I can see people again. How exciting. Um, would anyone like to ask some questions in the break? We've probably got about five, 10 minutes because my, sec my next sections are shorter because I had to do the background for that bit. Ah, oh, there you go, William Perry. <laughs> Thanks for that one, Maddie, about the bird, the bird boob thing. <laughs> Classic. I almost included it, but I couldn't think of a way to bring it in like an adult <laughs> into the slides. Okay. Does no one have any questions? Nobody disagrees with me. I'm going to take it as amazing. Um. <laughs> um, so, yields. Basically, um, yeah, I've got a couple of chapters in my thesis about the sublime. And the first one is exploring it as a, as a divine aesthetic and particularly looking at how it interacts with discussions and valorization of the natural world. So I don't know if you've read Kaya, uh, Mountain Gloom, Mountain Glory by Marjorie Nicholson, I think her name was. Um, it, for me, it was a really foundational text in mapping those um, connections between the sort of theo-aesthetic angle and um, the understanding and depiction of nature in the 18th and 19th centuries. So I don't know if that is helpful. The Lucifer TV show I'm getting onto in the next part. So I'm, I'm counting the Lucifer TV show as part of the romantic reimagination of Satan. Ooh, I can say so much about the devil giving dreams, so much. Um, so yes, basically you have this development, I'm gonna try and do a summary here. You have this development of the conception of dreams from the medieval through the early modern to the enlightenment periods. In the medieval period, you have this conception of dreams as being a period of danger when the soul is sleeping and you're more open to the influence of the devil. And that's still true to some extent in early modern writers such as Thomas Nash, for example, and Thomas Tryon, where in sleep, you are, your soul is, your soul and body are sort of acting in different places and your soul is awake, but you're also open to the incursions of the devil, either to influence your dreams or to appear in your dreams and give you supernatural dreams. 
So still in that early modern period, you have a very clear conception of the devil is doing stuff in dreams. Supernatural dreams exist and the devil can work in them. Not always. Sometimes it she had some cheese for dinner, um, but the devil's in there. And then when you're going into the 18th century, you're getting this discomfort with claiming supernatural dreams, but also a discomfort with getting rid of them because you have all of these biblical examples of dreams and biblical promises of prophetic dreams. So you have a lot of people taking a middle ground stance. And one of the critics that I found really useful as a summary of um, a lot of what was going on is a, a writer called Reverend Salfeld, and his work is online for free. Um, he wrote in 1762, I think it was translated into English, and he mapped the difference between all types of different dreams. So divine dreams, angelic dreams, demonic dreams, and natural dreams. So in the 18th century, you're definitely getting a broadening out of this category of natural dreams, where you're getting all sorts of uh, psychological explanations, physiological explanations, in keeping with kind of increasing levels of knowledge. But you also have these continuing discourses about how the devil uses dreams to tempt you, for example, um, by offering you visions of the thing that you desire or entering your dreams, such as you see in Victoria in, in, in her dreams of Zafloya. And you also have this idea of um, potentially prophetic dreams. So one of my readings is of the Italian by Anne Radcliffe and the dream that Vivaldi has as a demonic dream, because the whole idea of this dream theory is that you can see the origin of the dream based on its effect. And Radcliffe's books have quite a lot of, of clearly supernatural dreams in them with like revelations that they couldn't have known any other way, for example. Um, but in the Vivaldi dream in the Italian, he just sees the face of the murderer and sees the, the dagger um, and then wakes up and the guy's standing over him. And he, there's this line, I can't remember it word for it, but basically he descends into superstition in a way he hasn't before. So the effect of the dream is to plunge him into greater theological error. So I read it as a demonic dream. Mm, who knows? It's coming out in an essay next year. Um, <laughs> Could you talk a bit more about the devil as unwilling to be the agent of punishment? Yes, that is like a massive topic and a massive theological topic that you have there. It's not so much necessarily about the devil not wanting to punish people, but you have this really interesting relationship between the devil and the divine in terms of the devil as an agent of punishment. So in both the monk and Zafloya, you have the devil in his... Um, victory over Ambrosio and Victoria sort of crying out and being like, yes, God, you can't do anything to stop me now. Um, but actually ending up punishing the sinner in accordance with what God would want, theoretically. Um, so you're getting this sort of weird idea of the devil being unable to escape God's plan. And you have that laid out really clearly in um, Paradise Lost in Milton, when right at the beginning of book one, when Beelzebub and Satan are still in the lake of fire, Beelzebub's like, but bro, like, can we actually work outside of God's plan or will everything we do actually just turn to good? And the devil's like, no, we could do it. But obviously he just kind of doesn't. <laughs> Sorry, devil. Um, can I recap what I mean by perverse sublimity? Yes, I have two different options here, perverse sublimity and sublime perversity. But perverse sublimity is basically the idea of um, appearing to be sublime, but that being deceptive in some way, um, or it being corrupted in some way. So there are various types of perverse sublimity, and you can see this, for example, in um, uh, quite a few satanic depictions, that there's this uh, you know, it's the shadow of the archangel ruined. He's tall and he's mighty and he's got all of this fortitude, etc. And those appear to be sublime characteristics and they are, but they're not his own. They're borrowed from the divine aspects of his previous self and they're, they're partial and they're corrupted. So there's this perverse sublimity within the devil. And you can have a perversely sublime text, a sublime, yes, a perversely sublime text like I would argue uh, Paradise Lost is, where that perversity gets revealed within the narrative. Or you can have a sublimely perverse text where that perversity is never revealed, pointing perhaps to the heterodox theological stance of the author or the text itself. Uh, second, the dream question, answered it. What about the depictions of why is Satan, like in the sorrows of Satan and Master Margarita, where do they stem from? I mean, they're very particular and really interesting depictions of Satan, particularly in Master Margarita. Like, 
I think for me, they stem from more this kind of romantic reimagining where we're getting this reconsideration of the devil's relationship to the divine. What do you think Radcliffe's idea of sublimity's terror being an improving experience ties with the devil being himself terrifying? Is it through rejecting the devil or accepting that we have devilishness in us? Okay, so Anne Radcliffe very definitely rejected Burke's conception of terror as the ultimate root of the sublime. In, her, in the very famous essay, which you will know, um, differentiating between terror and horror, that's very clearly a critique of Burke's theory because she's saying not all, not all fear, not all of these terrible things are the root of the sublime. You have a differentiation. A really interesting and important critic for me here is Mary Schimmelpenning because she um, outlines in the early 19th century forms of the deformed sublime. And one of those is the horrid. And I think what you find in, um, for example, The Mysteries of Udolpho is Emily having to understand and work out the difference between that horrid and excessive sublimity and, and her predilection for a terror sublimity and work out all the different forms of sublimity that there are and appear and have a much more balanced view of the divine. So I do have on the Sheffield Gothic, I have a blog about that. Um, it's, it's kind of an intro though. So, I mean, if you're wanting to see more of my work on it, I can, um, I can send you some stuff. No worries. Just uh, shoot me an email. So I'm going to go on guys. That was quite a quick question time I'm running through it <laughs> just to make sure I finish. Um, so yes, thank you for the questions and I'm going to try and hopefully succeed in sharing my screen again. And we're moving on to those romantic Satans that we all love so much. Well, I do, I don't know about anyone else. Okay. Oh no, no, this one. Okay, cool. So um, I hope you appreciate, by the way, the amount of time I put in to making these break slides <laughs> anyway. So romanticizing Satan. Um, what I've wanted to do here is make a sort of differentiation between in this early Gothic period, the Gothic Satan and the romantic Satan. Because the Gothic Satan, as you're finding in the Monk and Zofloria, for example, is very clearly linked to that still theological conception of the devil as evil. But within the Romantic period, you have this reimagining based, as we've already talked about quite a few times, on a rereading of Milton's Paradise Lost and its depiction of this sublime devil, particularly in book one. So you have, this is the root of this reconception of Satan. You have this defiance where Satan is saying, not for those dire arms of God, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. What though the field is lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, the immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield. And what else is it not to be overcome? That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me. So you have this sense of the underdog rebelling, rejecting tyrannical power. Um, and you also have this veneration of, of freedom, for example, individuality and choice. So here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And so you're having, this is the root of this reimagining, and that sublimity of Satan um, that we've already talked about in the last section. Now that sublimity is being coded as, as pretty uniquely positive. So Satan becomes this heroic or anti-heroic figure. Now in the period, you're getting this kind of imagination of him. And I have used, this is for you, Kaya and Maddie, the sexy Satan statue. Um, Satan as rebellious, rejecting tyranny, celebrating the flesh to some extent. That's not necessarily from the Milton. Um, this idea of the individual over the crowd. He's still loyal and supportive, in a sense, to his followers, to his minions. But this conception of individual um, choice and rebellion and not following the herd. You also have this air of the tragic appearing. So this kind of doomed competition or rejection of a great tyrant. Mixed in with these ideas of his nobility, of his unconquerable pride, of his unconquerable willing to contest God's tyranny. And also this idea of the devil is very misunderstood. He's just trying to rebel. He's just trying to take down a tyrant. He's not trying to rule the world or anything. 
Anyway, you're finding in the 18th century, particularly towards the latter 18th century, and with the, the rise of sort of Jacobin sentiment and echoing these, um, this celebration in some circles, um, particularly of some of the dissenting, uh, rational dissenting Christian circles of the, the American Revolution and then the French Revolution, um, this sort of celebration of the French Revolution obviously tailed off to quite a large extent after the terror, um, but still exists to some extent. You're seeing the satanic figure um, in this political discourse, in this discourse of political subversion of, of proto-republicanism in some cases, or republicanism in some cases. Um, Satan becomes this figure, this, this figurehead of rebellion. So William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, you'll probably know them, a couple, um, the parents of Mary Shelley. Uh, William Godwin was a political philosopher. And in his inquiry into political justice, he venerates, in a sense, Satan, saying that he's a being of considerable virtue who bore his torments with fortitude because he disdained to be subdued by despotic power. So you have here this sort of celebration of Jacobin principles and also this use of the satanic figure tied in with Godwin's particular critiques of the penal state, for example, um, of this a bit, the suspension of habeas corpus in the 1790s as a result of kind of fears about um, the French Revolution of infecting Britain, uh, the treason trials of 1794, which took out quite a few of his friends. You've also got Mary Wollstonecraft using this sort of satanic figure and imagery. Um, and the quote here is from a critic called Adriana Creation, and she has argued that there's this tradition of feminist romantic Satanism. And you see this in both the depiction of Mary Wollstonecraft sometimes and in Wollstonecraft's own work. So this idea of a vision of outcast female genius hurled from the celestial sphere for having claimed equality. In Mary Wollstonecraft's um, vindication of the rights of woman, you have this kind of positioning of Wollstonecraft on the side of the devil through her rejection of the narrative of Eve and the passivity of Eve and her critique of the way in which Eve is denied knowledge. So this valoration of knowledge and this sense of Wollstonecraft putting herself in the place of the devil, both offering and tempt, tempting with knowledge, um, you're creating a form of feminist Satanism with not only the sort of rewriting of Eve, but the rewriting of Satan becoming uh, tied to depictions of uh, feminine autonomy, for example, and female desire. In the literary sphere, you're also getting these newly romanticized depictions of Satan and very often attached to different things such as theological critique. So in the previous section, we saw this idea of the heretic texts, but Byron just goes for the jugular. Um, he's not really messing about with, uh, with hidden coding. He's just going for it. And you have this amazing speech by Lucifer in his play Cain, which narrates that biblical story of, Clay, of Cain and Abel, um, where the devil is sort of tempting Cain He's commiserating with him about his doubts and his position and his, and Cain's cries, it's not fair. I didn't do anything. My dad did. What, so why is this happening to me? But you have this reading of Satan then as souls who use their immortality, souls who dare look the omnipotent tyrant in his everlasting face and tell him that his evil is not good. And then you go on um, a little bit further down. He says, he is great, but in his greatness is no happier than we in our conflict. Goodness would not make evil. And what else hath he made? But let him sit on his vast and solitary throne, creating worlds to make eternity less burdensome to his immense existence and unparticipated solitude. Um, so you have this quite clear here theological critique. And Byron, um, you know, it justifies that, yes, yes, but I put it in the mouth of Satan. We all know Satan's wrong. And look. At the end, Cain kills his brother. It all works out just like in the Bible. Um, but of course, contemporary critics weren't particularly fooled by this. And one of the key parts of their critique was this element of the sublime. They said the devil stays sublime. And so his critiques, his words stay having value. Um, and there's obviously quite a lot of theological critique going on here, um, but just a couple. There's a question of theodicy, um, i.e. Uh, the, the question of evil. Um, and this sort of also this question of free will arises and to what extent sort of Cain is free to act. 
There's a question, of course, of the intrinsic goodness of God coming up here and of the arbitrary nature of his will. Um, you have this, you know, why did he make us? Because he was lonely sort of um, discourse going on here. Um, you also have the idea of the validity of original sin being questioned. Um, why is Cain condemned as well, for example? One of my favorite lines there is, his evil is not good, but also goodness would not make evil. And what else hath he made? So that's really getting to the nitty gritty of that question of theodicy here. And there's no answer offered by the text. That's the problem. None of this is really refuted in the text. You also have, again, in this Byronic tradition, Satan becoming a romantic hero or anti-hero. This is from the Russian um, poet Lermontov Demon, and it's my translation, so it's garbage in terms of like the, the rhythm and stuff. <laughs> but you're getting, I mean, just look at that depiction. It's very clearly a, a Byronic conception of the demonic here. The mournful demon spirit exiled flew above a sinful earth, sowing evil without pleasure, pleasure even. Nowhere did his art resistance meet, and evil bored him now. In the barren breast of the exile, no new feelings, no new strength arose, and all that he saw before him he despised or hated. Now, of course, for our Russian uh, readers as well, this is, this is the, the Russian version of that Byronic hero, this Lishni Chelevyuk, the superfluous man. Um, but you're certainly getting this conception of the demonic anti-hero. So acknowledging his, his evil, but also acknowledging his will to change, perhaps, and, and really highlighting this conception of the demonic figure as tragic. Now, of course, the story doesn't end well. He falls in love with a human woman, gives some of the best and most beautiful promises you'll ever hear. Like, if you don't want to watch my video, totally fine. Um, but if you watch the video, I've put the timestamp in so you can just listen to that speech. Amazing. If not, go find it. Um, but at the end of it, we're told that the or the, the deadly poison of his burning kiss had pierced that instant deep into her heart. So that kiss is the kiss of death. And we looked at this from the perspective of the Byronic hero last time, but we're looking at it from the perspective of the satanic hero this time. So you have this conception of Satan who remains an anti-hero, remains partial villain, but with this sort of tragic Byronic core that can't end well necessarily, but for whom we inevitably have sympathy. And now this isn't really the same necessarily as that kind of rebellious uh, Satan, <laughs> sorry, figure that we're seeing in, in Godwin and Wollstonecraft necessarily, um, but it is connected to it, connected to this rereading. And it's what um, James McLaughlin, <laughs> I would argue, he differentiates between that radical rebel and Satan the asshole <laughs> who imagines himself God and still commits acts of defiance. Is still defying God's decree, even when we're having sympathy. With him. And we see that in Demon and Lerman to some extent, like the promises that he offers her are beautiful, but they're also defying God's decrees. Um, the most famous of these satanic anti-heroes though, for me and my favorite first Gothic book that I fell in love with, Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin. And here you very clearly see this sense of a satanic anti-hero becoming the center of a text where he's still a bit of an asshole, but you have this unconquerable sympathy. But what makes a Melmoth is another interesting question because he's, he is quite clearly evil within the text. And a lot of that is to do with these intertextual elements that you have but they also give him his tragedy. Now, all of these figures are, are sort of named or alluded to specifically within the text. So he's a form of new Adam, but unlike um, the second Adam, Christ, who brings salvation, he just keeps bringing damnation. But like Adam, he eats of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, because the story of Melmoth is like a Faustian pact story. He's a man who makes a deal with the devil for 150 years of extra life and knowledge. But the catch is he has to find somebody to take his place. And so what he spends his 150 years doing is trying to tempt people, drive them to despair and force them to take his place. Not force them, but um, encourage them, tempt them into taking his place. He's also uh, referred to as a form of Cain. So eternally marred, eternally marked 
the part where he's referred to as Cain is in the section about Emily. So he meets a woman who he falls in love with, somebody who was born uh, on a shipwrecked island, didn't know anybody until they know him. And that's the section where you get this clearest idea of this potential desire for remorse or repentance. But it's misdirected to human rather than divine love. But you see him saying, like, for a moment, I'm not Cain when I'm with you. I can cease my wandering. There's obviously the Faust narrative going on and also um, echoes of the wandering Jew. So if you're not familiar with that narrative, um, particularly popular in Germany, but arose across um, various different countries, this idea of um, a figure who mocked Jesus on the way to the cross and is uh, damned then to eternal life and eternal witness. So similarly, Malmuth has this eternal wandering, this eternal punishment, this eternal, this eternal embodiment not quite eternal, but long-lasting embodiment in the flesh. And he also is forced to become a witness, not like the wandering Jew to the crucifixion and to the resurrection, but a witness to his own failure and to the premise which Melmoth put in the introduction to the book, which, so Melmoth was a, an Irish preacher and his premise was nobody would sell their soul to the devil. Um, and so he, he keeps proving that fact. He becomes a witness to the fact that nobody would sell their soul and inadvertently therefore becomes potentially a witness to universal salvation. But that's really getting into the theological controversy. And maybe Melmoth just didn't think, Maturin just didn't think of it. You also have, of course, this satanic element to him. He's the eternal tempter and the eternal wanderer. But you can't help having this sort of sympathy with him, particularly in the section which relates him to romantic love. There are definite pros and cons to Melmoth. Pros, he seeks knowledge, that's great, right? Um, he doesn't tempt people who can't resist and he seeks his equals when he's tempting. So he's not so far gone that he's just preying on the dissolute. He arguably wants people to pass the test. You can read it how you like. He seems capable of love. He's certainly capable of cutting theological critique and colonialist critique as well. Um, and he, in a sort of very fortitude way, accepts his unenviable fate. The end of the novel is him returning to his ancestral home, uh, meeting his relative and just being like, yep, I'm going to be dragged off by demons tomorrow. You might want to hide in your room. So cons. Oh, oh, he also tries to save Emily. Perhaps, perhaps he tries to save Emily. Um, who he marries eventually and corrupts, etc., etc. Cons, he laughs at death, like literally though, not just, ha ha ha, I can't die. He laughs at people dying. He drives people to madness deliberately. He preys on the vulnerable. He abandons his wife and child to the Inquisition. He seeks forbidden knowledge. He helps literally no one. And he's, these critiques come from a place of cynicism, not from active potential for change. So this sense of Satan as the anti-hero, this rereading of Satan, this potentiality in Satan to be read as the tragic hero or as the ultimate rebel continues very obviously into the 20th century, both extra fictionally and fictionally. And one of the examples that I wanted to give was this kind of extra fictional reevaluation of Satan in the form of the satanic churches that have arisen in the 20th and 21st century. So you have the Church of Satan, which was started in 1966 by Anton LaVey and he was the high priest until Gilmore took over in the 90s after LeVay's death. Um, and not to be controversial, but the, the type of Satanism is much more related to this sort of the asshole Satanism that um, we talked about in terms of this veneration of the individual this veneration of the self above the community, this idea of, of wanting to be God, which uh, Gilmore says himself, so Satanists do not believe in the supernatural, neither God nor the devil. To the Satanist, he is his own God. So Satan is a symbol of man living as his prideful carnal nature dictates. So I'm not making any, I'm not entering into any controversies. I'm just looking at the different, um, the different paths that Satanism has followed or the satanic reevaluation has followed. So the Church of Satan focuses on individualism. It has a uh, a real interest in social Darwinism, though not officially on racial lines, on liberty in the sort of freer sense, and on the flesh. But that liberty can be manifested by actually restrictive social policies. The Satanic Temple in 2013 is perhaps um, more clearly the inheritor of that romantic reevaluation in terms of, it's again a secular movement, 
but it's about sort of rebellion and rejection of oppressive structures. It's also about community action and it valorizes certain forms of uh, virtue, so to say. So those are the seven fundamental tenets. Um, emphasis you can see on compassion and empathy um, and reason. Um, the justice against the institution, uh, bodily autonomy, and they um, sort of live out this faith in terms of social action quite frequently. You can look them up and different projects that they have in America, for example, um, which aim to kind of reinforce religious freedom and sort of move away from some of the activities of the, the Christian right or the, the, the power of the Christian right in America. So fictional versions of these kind of assholes and anti-heroes. <laughs> there's a couple of different, there's lots and lots of different uh, versions of this. this. This is one of the most popular, it's multiplied exponentially in the 20th and 21st centuries. This is one of my favorites um, from when I was a kid. Legend, um, directed by Ridley Scott, featuring Tom Cruise, eh, who cares, um, and Tim Curry, amazing, and Dark Lily there. Um, Basically, this is a satanic narrative where he's quite clearly evil, but to some extent, sympathy is created, the loneliness is sort of longing uh, for relation. And there's also very clearly here being underlined the temptation of this darkness. Um, the temp I mean, I mean, look at them. Look at that gif, though. Um, the temptation of this darkness, both to Lily and to the watcher and the reader. So you've got this, this sense of... Um, this romantic reevaluation of Satan creeping in here. More overtly, you have um, texts such as Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett and the Lucifer series. Now, I've not read the Lucifer um, graphic novels, but so I'm just talking about the series here. So apologies if something is like gratuitously wrong. Um, but you've got here some really interesting uses of this reimagined satanic or demonic figure. So in Crowley, obviously, you have him teaming up with an angel. And you have this rejection of that binary structure of the demonic and the divine by um, creating this pairing. And little paper in the works by me, you have this idea of queer shipping as a form of radical theological um, <laughs> interaction, just so you know. Um, and... Then you've also got, of okay, the case of Lucifer, for example, who's represented very clearly as a hedonist, uh, relatively amoral, but also um, gains sympathy and has this idea of sort of growth and, and change. So this, you're breaking down these kind of very clear, good, bad binaries that existed within this sort of Christian tradition, which was almost dualistic. So another break, and you get a gif of Tim Curry for this one. Um, so let me tempt you into asking a question. So if you have any questions, feel free to share. I'm really intrigued by the book full of activities aimed at children. Is that by the, is that by the Satanic Temple? That's not <laughs> like legend for some reason. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, any questions? I'm, I'm scooching up just to see if anybody said anything. I have not seen the Netflix documentary, Hail Satan. Um, that's it. Nobody has any questions about romantic Satans? I'm going to warn you now, I'm going into the theologies again in the next section, so brace yourselves. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any opinions on Supernatural's depiction of Satan because I'm a terrible goth and I've not watched it. Ah, I'm sorry. I was out of the country without a television um, when it was on and so that's like, that's my excuse. And then you get back and it's so many seasons. Um, so Romantic Satan is the bad boy romance prototype. Yeah, basically totes. Like, um, so last week we were kind of talking about this a little bit, um, how the Byronic hero became the, the romance bad boy archetype in um, the work of like the Brontes, for example, became metamorphosized. But you definitely see this um, in Satan. So in that poem by Lermontov, you have that really, really clearly. So you have 
um, the, the, the devil as romantic hero of a sort. Um, but you definitely get, um, the, you know, you get that, that break where the, the devil isn't the hero, but you've got those demonic elements and this kind of reimagination of, like the Byronic hero is a re, is, is a rose from the reimagination of Satan. Um, but, and then obviously in the 20th, 21st century, you're getting um, the demonic once again as a romantic hero, like the literally demonic, like, like Crowley, um, if you want to, if you, if you want to ship it, you can ship them however you like. Um, but that sense of, you know, in the intriguingness of the demonic. Ooh, exciting. I'm excited about that Lucifer comic book. I need to read it, really. Um, do I think Byron modeled himself after romantic Satan? Like, yeah, totally. <laughs> Byron was such a poser. Um, yes, Heathcliff as a romantic Satan crossover. So... Well, we talked about um, last week, of course, like how Heathcliff and Rochester differ. So Heathcliff is the is the sort of almost pure Byronic hero, anti-hero villain in a way, um, condemned by his own um, nature. And I think in that sense, he's much more clearly linked to the satanic figure than, for example, Mr. Rochester. Lady Devils, indeed. What about Lady Devils? So I've not um, discussed them particularly today, mostly because a lot of the texts that we're finding um, with Satan specifically feature um, masculine versions of Satan, including, uh, excluding, for example, something like Bedazzled. <laughs> but um, that sort of female satanic figure is more arising, I would argue, from the tradition of like the Lilith figure um, and so that's a whole other kind of argument and, and path to trace that development of the interest in the Lilith figure, who was, if you don't know, like the first bride of Adam, who was rebellious, basically. Um, yes. Yeah. I think it's really interesting about, like, I do need to read the Lucifer comic books because I, I was aware that the universe was different in the comic books to in the, in the TV series. I think, like, the comments I've made really refer to the TV series if we're looking at the TV series as a text, specifically. Um, oh, yeah, the depiction of Satan in the new Tr Sabrina TV show. Not watched it yet. Full disclosure, guys, I'm not a modern person. <laughs> so... Um, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of different paths down which these are going. And you can see something like, um, I believe that Sabrina's the queen of hell now, right? Am I totally wrong? Um, you're getting these links to that sort of feminist romantic Satanism, I would argue. You're getting all of these different interconnecting threads. Um, what I'm sort of looking at is um, the way in which these threads, which started in the 18th and 19th centuries, you can see them proliferating in the modern period in terms of like different tracks down which satanic and demonic depiction is going. Um, but they, they get wider and wider, in particular the idea of romantic Satanism and the valorization of, um, of a satanic figure definitely is so wide. Um, the problem of the statue, I mean, I know about it, but I don't know if there's something I can comment on, particularly in terms of um, thinking about the depiction of Satan, like it was a sort of legal drama, if I understand it, because they use the satanic temple's satanic figure without permission. Is that correct? I've been following it vaguely because I'm a goth, so I see this stuff on the on the on the Twitter timeline. But I've not, I've, as I say, I've not been. Um, I don't know what AFAIK means. Sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I don't, I don't, oh, as far as I know, thank you. <laughs> I am basically an 18th centuryist that's pretending to know how to live in the modern day, I guess. <laughs> okay, so um, there's definitely, there's so much cool research that goes on to these modern depictions of, of Satan and of, of um, I mean, if you follow the Sheffield Goths, several of them are obsessed with supernatural, so I'm sure that they're putting work out on it, for example. Um, so there's, there's a lot of good work going on there. If you know people that are doing really interesting work on these kind of modern iterations of Satan, like in Sabrina and Lucifer, etc., just pop them in the, in the comments because that would be really interesting for everyone, I think. 
any who's, um, I'm going to go on to the last section and I'm sticking to books. So I'm safe. I'm safe again. <laughs> um, and we're moving to a different national tradition. So let's have a quick look. <laughs> Hokey Cokey. So a little bit more of my Tim Curry gif there. We're moving to a different tradition now and specifically to the Scottish Gothic tradition. Now, I'm not wanting to make binary claims here in that the Scottish and the English or the Scottish and English uh, Iro, uh, Anglo Irish, Catholic Irish traditions are completely distinct. There's definitely some overlap, but I think there are some really interesting different trends in demonic depiction that you're getting within the Scottish Gothic. And it's because of very different sort of roots for these Gothic portrayals. So within the British Gothic, we've talked about the influence of these literary narratives of the satanic, including things like the Faustian Pact and the Sublime Satan. But what we're getting in the Scottish tradition is something really quite different. And it, a really intriguing quote I found when I was researching dreams is from Thomas Nash in the 16th century of all places. So just so that you know, I don't know how many people are super good on like theological movements, but um, the Reformation took place in the 16th century. And originally, there were, obviously, there was the rise of um, sort of Puritanism and radical Reformation Protestantism. And Thomas Nash was saying, the devil of late has grown a Puritan and cannot away with any ceremonies and will not be invocated with such solemnity as he was wont. Private and disguised, he passeth to and fro and is in a thousand places in an hour. So you have here, I think, this really interesting link between the, aesthetic, like, between the changing aesthetics of the satanic and the religious movements of the time. But within the English tradition, you, of course, didn't keep up with this radical Reformation Protestantism. You had the evolution and creation of the Anglican Church, which, um, and this is an br incredibly broad generalization here, but in terms of structure and theology, is more of a midpoint between Catholicism and radical Reformation Protestantism. But within the Scottish tradition, the Kirk of Scotland is Presbyterian, and there was a, a much closer kind of um, continuation of that radical Reformation tradition, particularly, for example, in the, um, the Covenanters, I think it was. Cameronians, is that right? Anywho, lots of um, a very Calvinist, very sort of radical Reformation Protestantism which took place and I think that part of the reason why the Scottish devil is so different is related to this theological change that took place. There's also of course the influence of folkloric elements in the Scottish tradition and you get texts like the Brownie of the Black Hags by James Hogg um, or the it, within the Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg you have the devil appearing octomocty with his cloven feet you, you have these elements of folkloric and sort of pagan influenced elements as well. But the major change is this theological move from this sublime, monstrous Satan to a Satan that poddles around and you can't really recognize him. A Satan who tempts you because you don't know who he is. And unlike these special case Faustian pacts with pacts we've looked at in the British and Irish traditions so far, you get the devil appearing as an adversary of the godly of everybody. And very close ties to this particular biblical conceptions of the devil that we find in the New Testament. The exhortation in 1 Peter to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Um, and also this idea of the devil as a false teacher who comes to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly is a ravening wolf. So this idea of the devil as being almost impossible to identify, having no real true form, and also being a false teacher, deliberately corrupting your theology, rather than tempting you necessarily, like, for example, to the flesh, as we see in the cases of um, Ambrosio and Victoria. These are sort of key elements of this Scottish tradition. One of the key texts, of course, is James Hogg and the Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner, which is amazing. Uh, everybody should read it. I love it to death. Um, if you're like a theo geek as well, it's 
Great. So in that text, we have um, the main character, Robert Ringham, who is, um, he belongs to a very severe form of Calvinism in, that verges on a sort of antinomian heresy. So antinomianism is um, connected to a Calvinist idea of double predestination. So predestination is the idea that you are saved before you're born. So you're elected, you're one of the elect. And if you're elect, you'll be saved. If you're not, then you won't. So double election um, in sort of a very strict form of Calvinism is the idea that you're already elected for life or for death. There's not much you can do about that. And then there's the question that has sort of troubled these Calvinist uh, conceptions of predestination about the relationship between faith and works. Um, and antinomianism is this, this sort of heresy that you don't really need to worry about what you're doing um, because none of it matters, <laughs> basically. And also connected to that as a total like a rejection of that Paulian education where it says, you know, should we sin more so that God seems more merciful? And Paul's like, no, <laughs> no, don't do that. And Antinomian's like, yes, let's do that. Amazing. Um, so Robert Ringham is on, on this sort of antinomian spectrum here. Um, and on the day that he understands that he's elected, finally, he meets a stranger called Gil Martin, whose face and appearance does seem to change, but quite often where's Robert's own face? And we have this cry from Robert that he was the same being as myself. So there are various sort of parts to Robert's journey and we can use him as a map to discover whether we ourselves have a demonic double. First of all, have you met someone new that looks like you, like Gil Martin? Do they want you to commit crimes? Gil Martin was always urging Robert into murder, for example. Do you keep losing time? Did you, oh, did you, did your brother accuse you of being places that you weren't? Do people keep seeing you out and about when you're in bed? Does everyone mysteriously hate you more than usual? Because everyone hates Robert anyway. And have you accidentally <laughs> murdered people without realizing? So gradually over the course of the novel, Robert really loses control of his own identity. And that um, differentiation between him and Gilmartin, him and the devil, becomes increasingly unclear. And it's unclear when he's acting, when Gil Martin is acting, um, whether Gil Martin is a separate person at all. But Gil Martin is his demonic double, increasingly eliding the difference between them. So what's going on here in the text? Well, this demonic double, first of all, is playing a game of souls with Robert Ringham. This is a term that Douglas Gifford coined where he says that the devil must not actually lie to Robert, but Robert must become his victim within a framework of truth. In the background to this slide, you can see a picture of the temptations of Jesus in the desert. So again, there's a really biblical precedent for this conception of the satanic. Using scripture, manipulating scripture, manipulating um, theological concepts in order to trick the, um, the victim into erroneous faith and into self-damning action. So there's a reliance on false doctrine, self-deception, and scriptural manipulation. But there's particularities to the theology of the demonic double in and of itself. Of course, there's this emphasis on duality that you find in this double identity of Robert and Gil Martin, and this sense of him being at times two different people in a very literal sense. You also have this conception of duplicity, um, <clears throat> this difference between the inward and outward, which is manifested by Robert's actions and Gil Martin's actions. Gil Martin's actions or Robert's actions when possessed, fulfilling the, the underlying desires of Robert, such as murder and sex. What is really interesting though here is this move towards an emphasis on the relationship between the devil and man. So in the, the, the demonic discourses, which we've talked about so far, often the emphasis in these sublime devils is on the relationship between the demonic and the divine. So I've explored that to some extent with the theoesthetics, this idea of whether the divine and the demonic are really so separate, this use of the devil to challenge the divine through questions such as theodicy. Whereas here, we're being challenged to consider the relationship between the devil and man and the inherent evil within man, that inherent duality that's sort of a cornerstone of Christian theology. 
this idea of total depravity um, connected to this concept of original sin, so that we're all born already polluted by that original sin of Adam. But within this kind of emphasis on total depravity and this emphasis on the devil um, and man, there's encoded this conception of the possibility of salvation. So interestingly, these Scottish Gothic texts arising out of a more strictly Calvinist tradition end up having more Armenian leanings or Arminian leanings. Um, Arminian theology uh, is the suggestion that we have some impact on our own salvation at the most basic level. And we have, for example, in Confessions of a Justified Sinner, these very overt chances for Robert to repent. So he's visited, for example, by an angel. And we certainly have this sense that God is individually interested in the salvation of Robert. He keeps offering to help him. In those um, depictions of the monk and Victoria, there's not really a chance. There's no out. There's just a continual decline. Whereas here, there's a possibility of change, but it's not taken. So there's an emphasis here on free will, um, as again, an Arminian sort of theology going on there. So this tradition of difficult to detect demons and demonic doubles is really evident throughout the Scottish Gothic tradition. And you have it right from sort of the early days up to the modern period. And often in texts which we don't necessarily think of as theologically um, um, based or connected to demonic depiction. Um, so one of the uh, classic difficult to detect demon stories is Wandering Willing Willie's Tale, um, which is an inset tale in Red Gauntlet by Walter Scott. And it features a, a laboring man who outwits the devil and his sort of terrible laird. Um, then you have by, um, I've got a few stories here by Robert Louis Stevenson. Although there are, there are also a lot of stories by, by James Hogg, um, such as The Brownie of the Black Hags um, and Mr. Adamson of Labour Hope, for example. Um, Stevenson wrote a number of stories which directly interact with this Scottish tradition of um, demonic depiction increasingly less clearly. So in Thrawn Janet, um, it's the devil possessing a dead body, basically. Um, in Markheim, which was the story that I read for one of the videos this week, you have a man committing a murder and then meeting after he's committed the murder, his own double, who appears to enter into a game of souls with him but by the end, you're not quite sure whether it was a devil or an angel trying to save him by picking apart his own bad theology. And then, of course, you have the most famous of all the double narratives in the 19th century, in the British tradition, at least, um, Jekyll and Hyde. So Jekyll and Hyde is quite often read um, according to ideas about uh, proto-psychology and psychology um, and science, etc. But there were very, very clear and overt and mentioned theological underpinnings to this investigation of demonic duality um, and this sense of um, the inherent duality of man, total depravity, the inability to, while living um, in this terrestrial plane, the inability to separate us ourselves from that um, sin, from that evil, from that dark self. I've put up here, you may notice Nathaniel Hawthorne is not a Scottish writer, <laughs> but I've put this up here just as a sort of aside that I think you quite often see this conception of the devil also appearing in the American tradition, um, inherited from this kind of like Puritan background, for example. Another uh, text is Witchwood, where you have um, sort of folkloric elements of the devil as a man in black, um, an excellent book, please read it. The Ballad of Peckham Rye, set in modern London by Muriel Spark, but again, with this quite banal, devil who seems to be is he evil is he the devil we're never quite sure um, but this sort of questioning interaction this playful engagement with this existing tradition of demonic depiction and then one of the most recent texts is the testament of gideon mack where an atheistic preacher ends up meeting the devil and this is quite obviously a really playful engagement a homage a rethinking of these demonic doubles in the scottish tradition so hopefully um, I have given you a bit of an insight into that third sort of strand of demonic depiction. And there are certainly um, elements of this that you might um, find in more modern films. One of the ones that sort of sprang to mind was maybe The Last Temptation of Christ, weirdly enough, and the little girl is Satan. Um, so like indecipherable, undiscoverable. Um, 
working her way through seeming in and innocence into temptations. So I'm just going to show you quickly, as before, I've got a bibliography and I will put my bibliography up online and I'll put my slides up online. So do have a look at those. Um, but for now, it's the break, the last break. So feel free to ask me any remaining questions. There we go. <laughs> Yes, does anyone have any questions? Do, 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 do. No, no, that's not what I wanted. A ver, Ginny in the Chamber of Secrets. I don't know what that's about, but cool. <laughs> hmm, not watched June either or read it. Terrible, I told you I'm not modern, not modern. Harry Potter? What, why are we, what are we naming? <laughs> Just naming texts. I don't know. I'm confused. I know that Ginny's from Harry Potter. Sorry. I didn't know why we were talking about Ginny, but that's okay. Oh, any possible links between the demonic double in Scottish theory and folk histories of doppelgangers? Yeah, no, definitely. I would say um, it's not something that I have really researched outside of that Scottish tradition. And I know that there's definitely very clearly a history of doppelgangers in different forms of literature, obviously in um, Hoffman and in, for example, the work of, is it uh, Gogol that had the, was that Dostoevsky, the madman with the double? Um, so there's lots of different kind of um, instances of doppelgangers and doubles. I think what's particularly interesting to me within the Scottish tradition is that creation of a very clear literary tradition of demonic doubles, which is sort of inextricable from the theology, which is often um, very clearly in injected into these texts. Might some of the banality of some modern depictions of Satan be related to a modern concept that humanity makes enough bad choices itself that it doesn't really need Satan's help? Sorry, I feel like this isn't well put, but I'm trying to listen and type. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, sure. Like, I think the banality of evil and uh, springs in a sense from some of this investigation of the way in which man and the devil are so close to each other. Ah, double by Dostoevsky, thank you. Um, basically, this kind of increasing concept that's entered the popular consciousness also through um, sort of the psychological discourse of, of internal duality and, and division and uh, multiplicity. And these. Um, this move away from the very clear binaries of good and evil. So when you get that, you inevitably get the banality of evil, I think. Not sure if this is way off topic, but this section reminds me of stuff about alien abduction. Do you think this has co-opted that tradition, trading demons for aliens? I mean, like, there's very clear links between, like, alien uh, narratives and demonic narratives, like, in the most literal extra-fictional sense, where people um, have interpreted demons as aliens. Um, so I think, yeah, there's definite overlap there. Um, they're quite often even relating to, to, to similar experiences being interpreted through different lenses, depending on the cultural like narratives and discourses that exist. So in the 18th century, you had this demonic discourse to explain um, uh, time lapses, for example, uh, whereas today you have um, alien narratives in a, a more widely spread. I think that would be my reaction to that question. Doppelgangers are pretty directly related to uncanny theory. Yes, they are, but uncanny theory postdates the doppelganger significantly. Um, so one of the things that, uh, like uncanny theory is, is great and cool and fine. Um, <laughs> she said, clawing at the table. <laughs> um, it is, like it's obviously very useful in discussing the Gothic. One of my problems with its um, extension and use in discussing 18th and 19th century texts is the way in which it dismisses and disengages from the existing discourse surrounding doubling and doppelgangers, which existed arising out of, for example, theological traditions. Yes, so Kyra as well, yeah, aliens and fairies, because like that, that fairy um, tradition, for example, in Scotland, there's a very clear sort of third tradition. So that you've got your demonic, you've got your angelic, and you've got your fairy as a third realm in, in um, poems like Kill Many, with people disappearing and reappearing um, with time lapses. In the film version of Dostoevsky story really does get across that banality. I mean, Dostoevsky was the master of that sort of, the banality of it all. 
was wondering about the other in Scottish Gothic as demonised. Do you see English figures as demonised here as you do in the Welsh figure? Hmm. Hmm. I think I'd have to um, consider it at length to give a proper answer. But basically, I think, yes, you do to some extent. I think I was reading some criticism on um, the Brownie of the Black Hag the other day by James Hogg and the fact that this quite clearly demonic female figure. Um, so the Brownie of the Black Hag has a, the, the wife of the Laird is a, a monster. Um, but there's a devil that sort of interacts with her and, and she ends up becoming enslaved to it, basically. But this idea that, you know, she's she's a Sassadak, she's from the South, she's English, and that's sort of part of this rejection of her as monstrous, potentially. I mean, I think you're always going to get that um, in narratives where um, you're experiencing sort of a colonial, a, co a colonised life. Um, and particularly that within the 18th century, still a lot of those sort of the scars and of the, the 17th century and what happened with um, the bishops wars and the interaction with the English civil war, um, all of that, the, the clearances, etc. It's all very fresh. Um, was that it? Have I missed anybody's questions? Because some of them like whooped, passed me perhaps. <laughs> Yes. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a whole other discourse, isn't it? Um, when you're getting really into the Scottish Gothic and talking about like the lowlands versus the highlands and different traditions and different understandings of what it is to be Scottish and who counts as Scottish, etc. Yeah, definitely. Like this is very much sort of an overview of these more complex issues. Um, any more questions? Cool. I'm going to put my Kofi link at the bottom just again, just in case anyone missed it the first time around. <laughs> um, there's also, of course, like check out the little YouTube playlist if you want to have something to listen to, I guess. But um, they're not, I don't have a great deal more to say about the text than I've said today. There's a little bit more detail on some of them, but not that much. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. If you want to turn your microphones on and say goodbye, that would be lovely. <laughs> um, Bye. Katie, Bye. Bye. Yes, there is another, so by the way. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you for today's yeah, lecture. Really wonderful. Bye, Sam. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you to everybody. Um, and yeah, there's, yeah. there's more. Um, if you've not signed up on the Google form, sign up. Um, there's one next week. The one next week is, I've renamed it, in case you didn't catch that on Twitter. It is now, who will rid me of that troublesome, of this troublesome priest? <laughs> Um, Gothic <laughs> faith and religious monstrosity. There you go. Mm -hmm. Exciting times. <laughs> so hopefully, like, yeah, do um, sign up for more if you want to. That would be amazing. And it was so nice of everyone to come. I think we had about 30. So that's pretty good. Exciting times. Uh, the Google form, if you would well, let me pop the link in. I'm sure I can find it quickly enough to make this work. Google form. Um, I don't know how you guys have managed to get here if you didn't have the Google form, but magic, absolute magic. Okay, copy and pop in the chat. Oh, oh somebody could have told me. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in as well, there we go. Um, yeah, so do feel free to send it. We've also got the book club this week, Exciting Times, we're reading Jamaica in, which is one of my favorite books of all time, so I'm super excited about it. Um, <laughs> So that is on Thursday, if anybody wants to come to that. And thank you so much for coming today. It was really nice to have the morning with you. And I will see you again next week, maybe. <coughs> Thanks so. again. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. There we go.